Hi, everybody. Welcome to Recovery from Relapse meeting of Overeaters Anonymous. Today is Tuesday, the 16th of July, and today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Trudy A. as our speaker. Trudy came to OA around about 2003, and she's here today to share her experience, strength and hope for, with us. Trudy, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rita. Hi, everyone. My name is Trudy. I am a compulsive overeater. I'm just going to take a, a second to just settle myself and um, just do the set aside prayer. Lord, today, help me set aside everything I think I know about you, everything I think I know about myself and everything I think I know about others everything I think I know about my own recovery for a new experience in myself and a new experience in my fellows and my own recovery. Thank you. I don't know how, but my phone's just popped off silent. So I've just re-silenced that again. So yeah, um, Reach is right. It was approximately 2003 I came into the rooms um, for the first time. Uh, I uh, really do qualify for this disease. And so I'll just um, speak a little bit about um, my childhood and um, the qualifications I've got to be here today. So um, I'm one of quite a large family. There's six of us. I was the third born, the third girl, um, and they really wanted a boy. The twins arrived. Um, 18 months later and there was a boy um, and then I've got a younger brother as well and um, so I was the middle child. Um, my mum says that I was a very quiet child and I just fitted my purpose because the others were so boisterous and she could leave me to be quiet and I'd say that I was really quiet. It, it, they were so loud, so loud and um I'd try and join in conversations um, with them, maybe around the dinner table. And I'd be waiting for my turn and I could never get it out. And I am a little bit like that. I'm a very shy person. So if you get me speaking for a long time, um, yeah, it's um, a difficult one. But it, it's, um, yeah, so it was a very loud family. Um, one of the things that I remember my dad saying as a very young child, sit Trudy opposite me because I wasn't fussy with my food. I just got on with it and quietly um, ate. And um, there was uh, something that I was, I, something popped up in my memories the other day. Um, and it was from being extremely young. We lived on a farm. Um, and the shop was quite a distance away, but within within walking distance. And because I was sensible, I was allowed to go shopping for my mum with a shopping list. And she would say to me, if there's any change, you can buy something for every everyone, you know, from the penny tray or whatever. And so I'd get these treats and for my other five siblings, but somehow, on the journey home, I'd vet mine and then I'd start on one of the others and I'd think to myself, oh, I'll just tell them that um, I, I, I got it wrong when I was counting the amounts or I didn't have enough money. But sure enough, by the time I'd got home, I'd eaten all six portions of these treats. Um, and that just carried on. Um, uh, I... We didn't have, um, there wasn't, it wasn't like it is now with the confectionery around um, as it was then. It was, if you wanted a snack, you just had to make a sandwich. Um, and um, and that's what sustained us from one meal to the next or have a piece of fruit. And then at the age of eight, my parents split and um, I often... I used to think that it was such a horrible thing to have happened because um, we were taken away from the farm. We were moved into a town. Um, my dad stayed on the farm um, and the farm's still there now uh, today. And um, 
but I also think I, I'd gone to a very small school and um, really I think that my life opened up slightly when we went to when we moved away because I went to a bigger school there were um, people at the school from all different races um, and um, there was more freedom um, you could just go and jump on a bus and go to Granny's or wherever. And so, yeah, but there was also the other side of it that my mum wasn't very well at all. And um, uh, she tried to take a life. Um, one of the times we had to keep singing to her and um, playing with her hand until the ambulance arrived. And... Um, so food became a coping mechanism that I had and um, it was something to soothe me with um, and I found that it really did work. You know, some sweet food would help when I wasn't coping very well with things. Um, we didn't have a family where we... Um, talked about feelings and um my mum wasn't a lovey dovey mum. Um she still isn't. Uh and um yeah so I um I'd I'd hide behind food as well and um also I never knew how to act. I never knew how to be and so I'd copy other people I'd take a little bit off that person and a little bit off that person and think that that was the persona that I should be um I also had um uh, yeah the imposter syndrome as well where I would think that I was to blame for things when I wasn't um and it all around revolved around food um so much so that um and also we didn't have much money. Um, and so I started work at 13. Well, actually, I started at 10. I started a paper round at 10, but actually at 13. And um, I was like a mini adult. I um, saved up and I bought my mum an automatic washer because I was sick of going to the laundry. Um, and um, I, um, I had my own money and it, it was thrilling that I could pay for things and um I didn't have to ask and I could save up and everything and the work that I went into was catering I went to college for catering why wouldn't it be food you know why wouldn't it be food um and uh yeah the the food was always my safety blanket so if I got into um uh you know if I fell out with a friend or whatever and they were all going out without me I would stay in and I would buy myself a box of treats and I would think that that was you know good and it it really really did soothe it really soothed um I uh, got into a relationship at um 18 uh, my first serious relationship and that that broke up and so I decided to do um, a relocation and um, move away and I moved to some beautiful islands um, working just for a short summer season um, because it's nine months I was there and it just opened my eyes up it was just I just loved it absolutely loved it but again it was in food the work the work was in food and it was also servile I was a waitress at this hotel and by this time the food treats and the extra bits had started to um, show on my body and so um, I started to use um, laxatives and um, one of the very shameful things um, that I'd done I'd overtaken them and ended up having to leave the island on the um, hospital boat. Um, and I was so embarrassed. I just said that it was a really bad tummy ache. 
and they thought at the hospital that I had an ectopic pregnancy and I'm like no no I haven't had I, I'm definitely not pregnant I'm definitely not pregnant but the men who were driving the boat from the one island to the island with the hospital on had been at work and they were volunteers and uh I always used to think anyway, last year I did make amends to that. I, I didn't to those particular men because I couldn't find them, but I did make a monetary Trudy. amend. Thank you. 10 minutes, did you say? 20. I've been, I've been speaking for 20. Gosh. No, this, this is 20 minutes left. Oh, right. Thank you. Yeah, thank right. you. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, so, um, but that wasn't my first brush with laxatives. Um, I had another one where I ended up at hospital as well, and that was at uni, and I tried to um, to uh, compensate for eating too much, and um, I ended up um, going to A&E, and again, I couldn't tell them, uh, and they suspected that I had an appendicitis, and it did, fortunately, move on. Um, and I just always used food, um, in between those two times, I would have, um, I went to pay and weigh. Um, I tried all different types of diets um, and I could lose the weight, um, but I couldn't ever keep it off. There was always a time and, you know, just as um, in the big book, you know, um, in the doctor's opinion, it says, doesn't it, that um it's uh, allergy of the mind a twist of the mind an allergy of the body and once I start I can't stop and that's what it was like so I could restrict for cer certain lengths of time and then it was like nothing was ever enough nothing um and I would just go absolutely mad um and I managed to control my weight because I thought that's what it, it, it was wrong with me. It was my weight. Um, and I'd always had a dream, you know, get married, have children. I, I wanted children from being very young, but because I'd come from a split family, I wanted to be in the perfect relationship, if there ever is a perfect relationship. Um, anyway, I met my husband and... Um, we had um, my son, which was 30 years ago, but after I'd had him, oh boy, did the, the emotions come up and did everything sort of just got magnified. Um, I put on an awful lot of weight. Um, I had um, some hormone imbalance and I ended up having to have um, a hysterectomy when he was three, so I could only have the one child um and I went to um a psychologist for my weight I just a psychiatrist sorry um I tried hypnotherapy I had a, a thing put in my ear to try and see if that works like a little stitch thing nothing nothing works and um I'd lost a little bit of weight after the operation and also, my back was extremely bad. I had to have an operation on my back. Um, and I still couldn't shift the weight. And my doctor just happened to mention, I, I went to her and I told her that I was binging. Um, and, you know, because I've been, again, in um, the pay and weigh groups. And um, I'd started to put weight back on. I hadn't lost a great deal, but I'd started to put weight back on. And I went to my doctor and she told me about Overeaters Anonymous. Did I go then? No, I didn't. Um, if you want to just put the photographs up now, Rita, I'll just, and then I'll. Please, thank you. So the first one, um, the one with my stripy shorts, I was on holiday um, camping with my son and my husband. Um, I think that was actually just before the hysterectomy, yeah. And um, 
I was almost, I think I was around about 20 stone. I was in a size 24 clothes. I'm almost six foot, so the weight does fit well on me. Um, and then um, fast forward a little bit, and the one in the middle at the bottom is me on my horse. Um, so I had, I had, um, I had gone to away. I'd found her way, and I'd got um, quite a bit of recovery, as you can see the physical recovery. And um, my horse, um, I bred when my son went to boarding school um, because I'd, I'd not got a child and I just, and we had this horse and I just decided that I would breed her and Mabel was the result. And I had her for three years. Just, uh, I, I thought, and I used to say to her, one day lady, I'll get on your back and when I'd been to OA, I could ride her, um, not properly because of my back, but I could get on her and I was in the arena. I still stay in touch with her now. She's now 14, 15, 15, yeah. And so I went to OA and all was well. Um, the first, uh, first time I went, um, oh, I'll just do the photographs. Um, I left OA. I was away from OA for about, Ten, uh, eight years I think it was and as you can see in the bottom um, left hand photograph I regained most of my weight um, the top one with the blue top on is when I've been in OA two weeks back in OA two weeks almost two years ago and I'd started to shed some of well I hadn't started to shed some of the weight but I'd definitely got a big smile on my face and um I was more in tune with um what what was happening and I was so pleased that I was back. Um the one at the bottom left hand corner with my arms held out is at the Mellon Cove, which is a um a place in Yorkshire and it's up um a cliff edge um of rock formation and there's 400 steps there's no way I would have been able to walk up those steps the way that I was before um and that was part of my 60th um, which was two years ago that was eight last year actually so, but it was part of my 60th bu bucket list that I wanted to climb the Malum Cove got lots of different things that I wanted to do and that was one of them and that's just in front of the tarn, the Malum tarn. And I was just so overwhelmed that I'd done that. And the one above it is last September, we went to the Isle of Wight and I just love hugging trees. And I couldn't believe that I'd found a tree that I couldn't get my arms completely round. And um, as you can see, the physical side of the recovery is quite prominent. Yeah, Rita, thank you. Um, so. When I went into the rooms originally, after the doctor had told me, I think it was about six months later, I went with a friend because I was too shy to go on my own. And she also um, had the same affliction with food as I had. And I couldn't believe that um, there was two other people at this meeting. They were due to close that week because they hadn't been able to pay the church, the rent for the room. And um couldn't believe that they were tell saying things that I had always kept secret. You don't say that out loud. Don't speak about that. Um, you know, binging on food and uh and they also read the welcome home. The welcome home is just yeah, and I I could relate to all of it, you know. I hid myself away, I closed the curtains. Um I did everything. And uh, so you're going to think, right, she's found her way. So she's she's on a journey. I didn't go back for another couple of weeks because my friend was working and she couldn't come. Anyway, eventually I managed to go on my own. And I can say about that um, meeting, that was sort of in the June. Uh, in the January, we'd started to get more people um, joining. And it was absolutely amazing um, from being four of us and sometimes just two of us around a table. We had to move rooms 
and we had um, 20 plus every week. It was just amazing. And um, the other thing was, there wasn't Zoom about then, but um, we sponsored each other. Um, so it was only the the amount of where we'd got to on the programme, where we, how we could sponsor each other. Um, the big book, I've got to say that the big book, I couldn't read. I've since thought I've learned that. Ten minutes the big left, book, Trude. Two minutes left. The big, thank ten. you. The big, ten, thank you. <laughs> ten, thank you. The big book is meant to be re read with another person. That's my, this is my thing, not anybody else's, what I'm saying. Um, and I used to think, and these aren't my words, that the big book was written before women were invented and it's an olden days book and the writing was just so difficult for me to understand. Um, we had big book um, study meetings, still couldn't understand it. I was still like, yeah, maybe an odd word would make sense. But um, so um, I used the 12 and 12 um, and the 12 and 12 workbook and um, worked through, stumbled through the steps. I think now I was doing the OA waltz, you know, the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, back to one, two, three. I was always scared of my fourth step. I did do my fourth step with someone who's here. And I remember her saying to me, is that your fourth step? I think I had two pages um, <laughs> of stuff. And um, so, but I did sponsor other people and um, there was loads and loads of recovery. And then um, my ego started to slip in and I just started to think that perhaps I could do this by myself. I'd started to put weight on because the food wasn't as clean as it had been. And... Um, I thought, actually, and my sponsor at the time, she was so good. She said, look, um, I think maybe it, it might be helpful for you to either find somebody with a different voice than me or just have a little break and see, you know, sometimes you need to have more time out there. And I certainly did. I didn't think it was going to be eight years away. Um, so... That brings I I went back into the wilderness and you can see from the pictures, um, it didn't work. But it's not about the food; it is all about um, working through um, the program. And so, two years ago, I was invited to a friend's house in France with three uh, two other friends. Um, so there were four of us all together, and they'd gone back to OA. And they'd had re really good recovery and I kept in touch with them and they'd said about it. And I was just still on the sort of peripheral. But I went with them to France and I can't tell you the serenity around them, the ease around them. It was just so beautiful. I wanted what they had. I ate sanely. I ate like they ate whilst we were there but it's not about the food it was that it was that that I wanted I want that I wanted that sereneness I wanted that peace I wanted that and I'd had it before little glimpses of it and I wanted it back so when I got back from France um I phoned one of them and I said I want I want to come back and she uh sort of taught me through how to get on a zoom meeting but still I don't think there were I think face-to-face -face meetings were only just opening up again then and I got back in I got a sponsor I also got covid when I came back from France but it didn't stop me I started and my sponsor said we're working through the big book it's like oh and did it for, for um the vision for you way so for each chapter, I had to listen to podcasts. I had to read it, see which bits stuck out for me. And I had to also find uh, three other people to, to read bits with. And eventually I 
built up a God squad of people. Um, but I can't tell you how this book has absolutely changed my life. Absolutely. And, you know, it's not about the food. It's about why you are in that food, you know, why you're using that food, just as other com uh, other addictions, you know, why you're using that substance, what is what are the reasons behind it. And it's not until I actually put the food down and delved into the big book, worked through the steps and it was amazing, yeah. So I have a sponsor. She has a sponsor who also has a sponsor. And then it came to, again, sponsoring. And I have sponsors um, that have gone through the big book with me again and um, working on other things. Um, I've just had, I lost my dad in October. I was abstinent throughout. Um I've had um, other friends that have died earlier on this year. Uh, my husband had a real bad hospital scare, um, really um, quite, there's somebody at the door, just going to ignore them. Hopefully my husband will get it. Um, and then, um, and then seven weeks, eight weeks ago today, one of my nephews took his life. Um, my sister found him, who's his mum, and she's in bipolar. And uh, I, I was able to um, comfort her and be with her. I didn't have a relationship with her before. It's funny how higher power sends things your way. Um, I still don't have a brilliant relationship with her. Um, in fact, earlier on today, um, I've had to withdraw from a phone call from her and do a big and uh, do a step a little step 10 on it um but just knowing that I'm not any different than anybody else I've got this disease that's not right it's not that I'm not any different than anybody else I have a disease and it's not my fault that I have this disease, just as my sister has bipolar. It's not her fault that she has bipolar. And the acceptance around that um, and the humility that I've had to show over the last seven, seven, eight weeks. I don't, I don't know how I've done it. And I've done it abstinent. And I've also done it with the help of some of you people here. And um, I haven't really talked too much about all the great things in here but I just want to read this little bit um about acceptance because it was the acceptance that there wasn't another place there wasn't another door there wasn't anywhere else that I could go to and I found it here with my tribe away so it's from page 417 of the big book two minutes and left acceptance. Trudy Thank you. And acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing or situation, some facts of my life unacceptable to me and I can find no serenity until I accept the person, place, thing or situation as being exactly the way it is supposed to be at this moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake until I could accept my alcoholism. I could, could not stay sober unless I accept my life completely on life's terms. I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on what needs to be changed in the world as into what needs to be changed in me and my attitude. I'll just quickly say how, how it works for me. So, because um, I, I really don't know how I do this, but I have a higher power. In the mornings, I have to reconnect with that higher power. I, have, I do meditation, I read, I journal, very small amounts of journaling sometimes. I pray, I really pray, I really, really pray. 
I also have to connect with that higher power throughout my day, just as you would with a friend. You wouldn't um, be in touch with a friend just in the morning and then leave them. Um, I have to do it throughout the day. And then I also do, um, I, I have contact with my sponsor in the evening and with a, um, a sponsoree as well, do a nightly review of my day to just see if there's anything that I need to pick up on. I do the, uh, um, in the maintenance steps, I'll do a step 10. However, I am doing an in-depth step time with my, there. thank you, through, with my, uh, on my sister through the big book. And um, thank you for listening. I just hope that somebody has got something or other. Um, there is one other thing. Somebody sent me this and it's very short today. And it's a Joan Rivers one. She says, listen, I wish I could tell you it gets better, but it doesn't get better. You get better. So work it. Thank you. Oh, wow, Trudy. Thank you so much. Thank you for that message of depth and weight. We're just going to read out page 316 in the big book. Just a little paragraph that sums it up. No one who drank or ate, as I did, wakes up on the edge of the abyss one morning and says, things look pretty scary. I think I better stop drinking or eating before I fall in. I was convinced I could go as far as I wanted and then climb, climb back out when it wasn't fun anymore. But what happened was I found myself at the bottom of the canyon thinking I'd never see the sun again. AA or OA didn't pull me out of that hole. It gave me the tools to construct a ladder with 12 steps. 